on behalf of the uh, Historical 2020 Committee here at First Presbyterian Church, I'd like to welcome all the members of the congregation and any visitors that we have. Um, this is a celebration of the 200th anniversary of the founding of our church and also the 155th anniversary of George Custer marrying Libby Bacon here in the sanctuary. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the reenactors who have taken the time to come here today to help out with this, especially Steve Alexander for organizing it. And I'd also like to invite you to a um, small reception uh, cake and punch after the service, and it's downstairs in our fellowship hall. Um, now I'll turn it over to Richard and Jeannie Micka to narrate the program. Good afternoon. The country was already into two years of war. In 1864, ushered in the promise of hope for a small community on our shores of Lake Erie. It would be the fulfillment of a proposal and would become known as the wedding of the century. The proposal of George Armstrong Custer was as unique as he was unique. Although he had been born in Ohio, Custer had grown up here in Monroe. During his early years, he had lived with his half-sister, Lydia Ann Reed, and attended Simmons Academy, once located on the corner of Front and Macomb Streets. After his successful graduation, he returned to Ohio and taught school for a year before he entered West Point Military Academy. When the Civil War began, he was graduated and served with distinction, attaining the rank and title of the youngest general in the history of the United States Army. When leave permitted, he returned to Monroe. On one occasion, he was introduced to Elizabeth Cliff Bacon, called Libby. She was said to be the prettiest girl in Monroe, and she was. And it wasn't any wonder that Custer fed hell over heels in love with her. Duly smitten, he donned his West Point full dress uniform and on bended knee asked for Libby's hand in marriage. She accepted. But it was her father who objected, and after a year of tactical romance, the old judge relented and agreed to a February wedding. With furlough secured, George Armstrong Custer, or Audie, as his family and friends called him, arrived in Monroe on January the 30th of 1864. Preparations and plans were all in place. On Tuesday, February 9, 1864, the day before Lent, all of Monroe prepared for the wedding of the century. Victorian superstitions claim a Tuesday wedding bode well for good health. Judge Daniel Stanton Bacon had promised himself he would not cry during what would be the most splendid wedding ever seen in the state of Michigan. Bundled in heavy clothes against the cold weather, guests began arriving at the First Presbyterian Church, this church, long before the appointed hour. Shortly before six o'clock, the church was filled to almost suffocation. Every seat of the old style box views were taken by more than 200 participants who appropriated the gallery and vestibule for standing room only. The stately 1846 brick church, the oldest Presbyterian church in Michigan, and the oldest continuous Protestant church in the state, was com comfortably toasty from the pressed bodies within, but those not so fortunate stood outside in the snow, hoping to get a glimpse of the boy general and his bride-to-be. They had arrived some hours earlier with their appropriate attendance and changed within the church. 
Now, the Custer family arrived in Moss. Emmanuel ex exited the sleigh first, helping Maria and Margaret out. Tom, in his military uniform, handled the, the horse off to Boston Custer, who had been searching for a place to tie him. The Reeds came along behind, and each family entered the church and were escorted to the front where a special box was reserved for them on the west side of the pulpit. Here they come. Welcome all. The Bacon family arrived next, long affiliated with the Presbyterian Church. The judge was an elder, and Libby was a teacher of the infants class. Reverend Erasmus J. Boyd, principal of the Young Ladies Cemetery, Seminary, not Seminary, where Libby graduated, assisted by Reverend Dr. Charles N. Mattoon, were to perform the traditional marriage service. Promptly at 8 p.m., the organist, Mrs. Minnie St. John Loranger, piped up the wedding march, and the bridesmaids entered on the east side aisle led off by Ann Dara and Marie Miller, dressed in white Tarleton, with gauze veils just reaching their shoulders. And they were coming this way. So the bridesmaids are entering now on the east side. Very well. Thank you. Audie's groomsman, Conway Noble, and John Balkley, who had been Custer's desk mate at Stebbins Academy, made their way down the west side of the fields. There they come. And at Humphrey, Libby's best girlfriend was her maid of honor. She followed next down the east side as her beau, Captain Jacob Green, who was Armstrong's adjutant best man, would later go on to head one of the nation's largest insurance companies, Metropolitan Life. He sought her down the west side in full dress uniform. And here they come. We're in the The groom, in Brigadier General dress frock and sash, appeared next, with the uncharacteristic shorn locks escorting the bride's mother, Rhoda Pitts Bacon, down the west aisle to Delta. Join this man and this woman in holy marriage. We 
which is instituted by God, regulated by his commandments, blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ, and be held in honor among all men. Let us therefore reverently remember that God has established and sanctified Mary for the welfare and happiness of mankind. Our Savior has declared that a man should forsake his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. By his apostles, he has instructed those who enter into this relation to cherish a mutual esteem and love, to bear with each other in sickness, trouble, and sorrow, in honesty and industry to provide for each other and for their household and temporal things to pray for and encourage each other in the things which pertain to God, and to live together as the heirs of the grace of life. For as much as these two persons have come hither to be made one in this holy estate, if there be any here present who know any just cause why they may not lawfully be joined in marriage, I require him now to make it known or ever after to hold his peace. And plenty and in want. In 
plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live, as long as we both shall live. Now, Libby, will you take Armstrong's right hand in yours and repeat after me? I, Elizabeth Swift Bacon, take thee, George Armstrong Custer, to be my wedded husband, and I do promise and covenant before God and his witnesses to be thy loving and faithful wife. In plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, as long as we go together. Please repeat after me. This ring I give thee in token and pledge of our constant faith and abiding love. This ring I give thee in token and pledge. I forgot the rest. Of our constant faith and abiding love. Of our constant faith and abiding love. Church, where a crowd of well-wishers 
applauded, cheered, and threw rice and birdseed as they climbed aboard in a sleigh drawn by four white horses that whisked them off to the bacon home for a formal reception. Today, you all join us for a reception here at the church and hope to see you all back next year at this time for annual Custer Week. Thanks for coming and have a safe journey as they proceed out to the sleigh in the snow. The wedding now departs. The wedding party departs. In good order. Gentlemen, you may return your sabers. congregation while the honor guard is dismissed. Would you please keep your seats? We have a few things to say at the moment. We'll wait for the honor guard to take their dismiss, get their, uh, their charges from their commander. Before you prepare to leave, Jeannie Mecca has a few words to commemorate this most prestigious event, Mrs. Mecca. Is it not cute to have the littlest saber bearer? In the formal parlor, decorated with white and orange blossoms, the wedding party received their guests. Showering them with congratulations, over 300 townsfolk and relatives squeezed past the judge, and Rhoda, Audie's parents, Nettie Humphrey, the bride and groom, and their attendants. Audie was quite attentive to Libby and never left her side. Displayed in the same hall room for all to see with a, the silver service from the Vermont Along with the cake basket, caster, parasol dishes, berry spoon, and a pitcher with the waiter and two goblets. The picture was inscribed, presented to the bride of Brigadier General G.A. Custer by the officers of the 1st Vermont Cavalry, February 9, 1864. The 7th Michigan Cavalry also presented the couple with a companion 7th Peace Silver Tea Service. There were berry spoons, a wedding spoon engraved, Libby C. Bacon, February 9, 1864, a silver card case, Silver cell phone, copper card receiver, gold lined thimble, napkin rings, syrup cup, sugar spoons, two white silk fans, Mrs. Elizabeth Barrett Browning's published points, Whisper to a Bride, and a lavishly bound edition, a net brick of shawl, a mosaic chest stand of marble, a handsome Bible from Judge Bacon, and a white parasol with black lace from Libby's stepmother. Audie's gift to Libby was a gold hunting case watch with her new initials, EBC, on the outside. Guests partook of three wedding cakes, one elaborate cake and two smaller ones for the bride and groom. The larger, a rich fruit cake, was decorated with white frosting and orange blossoms. Libby's smaller white cake was cut and the first piece was set aside for a later anniversary. The groom's cake was much darker and a small thin piece was given to guests as they departed by 10 p.m. As soon as the cakes were cut, Libby and her bridesmaids disappeared upstairs, where they helped her to change into her brown traveling dress. From her wedding bouquet, she gave each of her bridesmaids a red rose. At midnight, the entire wedding party boarded a train in Monroe, bound for Cleveland. It was an unrestful evening for Judge Bacon, as he stayed awake all night for fear of burglars stealing the wedding gifts 
which he packed up and took to the bank for sleep the next morning. Thank you. Thank you all and the ministers. Let's have a big hand for them. Thank you. Thank you. 